Greetings, and welcome to the National Bone Marrow Transplant Link Survivorship Webinar. At this time, all participants are in your listen-only mode. A question and answer session will follow the formal presentation. You may ask a question at any time by typing it into the Ask a Question feature on the left side of your screen. If anyone should require operator assistance during the conference, please press star zero on your telephone keypad. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded. It is now my pleasure to introduce your host, Jennifer Gillette. Please go ahead. Thank you so much, and welcome everyone today. We're so glad you can join us for our survivorship webinar, addressing the many physical and emotional issues following a bone marrow stem cell transplant. Uh, just a basic outline for how we're going to work today. First of all, I'm going to take just a couple minutes to tell you a little bit about the National Bone Marrow Transplant Link and what we do. And then we will have our speaker, Christina Ferraro, who is, um, uh, runs uh, Survivorship Healthcare. And uh, we have Amanda Budai, uh, who will be talking to us about transitions, mindfulness, and meditation. And then Katie Shepner about healthy habits and being empowered after transplant. Once everyone has spoke, we will get to our question and answer period. Now, for those of you who might not be familiar with the National Bone Marrow Transplant Link, our mission is dedicated to helping individuals and their families from diagnosis through survivorship. We work with hospitals, cancer centers, individuals, families, and other organizations by providing resources, support, and education. If anyone would like some more information or support, we've got our information on the right that you can either call us or email us. We have some great resources for you. Uh, first of all, we have uh, uh, our niche working with chronic graft-versus-host disease. We just have a webinar that was recorded a couple of weeks ago that you could check out. We've got some great podcasts, resources, blogs, and uh, support. We also have our Lunch and Learn with the Link program, our multiple webinar series that can be viewed online, our peer mentor program for patients and caregivers, second birthdays recognition program, and we also have several books, audiobooks, and materials and referrals. A special thanks to our webinar event sponsors, Be the Match, Jazz Pharmaceuticals, and the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. Just a reminder, today's program is not meant to give you individualized medical advice. Uh, this is to inform you about uh, survivorship, but it is important that you talk with your own healthcare provider about your own individualized medical care plan. Now, introduction to our speakers. I'll introduce you to the first, uh, the three speakers, and then we'll start with Christina. Christina completed her Bachelor of Science in Nursing at The Ohio State University in 2001 and received a Master of Science in Nursing and certification as a family nurse practitioner from Kent State University in 2016. She joined the Cleveland Clinic in 2003 as a registered nurse on the inpatient blood and marrow transplant unit and became an outpatient BNT nurse coordinator in 2006. Christina currently leads the Victor Fazio MD BMT Cancer Survivorship Program at the Cleveland Clinic and has experience in seeing patients with graft-versus-host disease and patients in long-term follow-up, emphasizing patient empowerment, education, and support. Christina has presented at numerous regional and national conferences, including the Oncology Nursing Conference, a Plastic Anemia Myodysplastic International Foundation, the American Society of Transplantation, uh, Transplantation and Cellular Therapy meeting, and BMT InfoNet and clinic, our Cleveland Clinic Nursing Grand Rounds. Christina is an active author, presenter, and educator on the topic of BMT and survivorship and participates in research focused on survivorship and post-transplant complications. Our next speaker, Amanda Budai, earned her bachelor's degree in social work from the Edinburgh University and her master's degree in social work from the University of Pittsburgh. She has been a clinical social worker at the UPC Cancer Center for 11 years, working with patients and families with hematology malignancies, stem cell transplant, and most recently, CAR-T therapy. In 2018, she was named Leukemia and Lymphoma Society Hematology Oncology Social Worker of the Year by the Association of Oncologists. 
And then Katie Schuffner, Manager of the Counseling Services at Be The Match uh, National Marrow Donor Program, where she has worked since 2014. Before joining Be The Match, she was a clinical social worker at the University of Minnesota Adult Blood and Marrow Transplant Program. Katie holds a Master of Social Work degree from the University of Minnesota School of Social Work and a Bachelor's degree in Psychology from Gustavus Adolphus College. She is a member of the Association of Oncology Social Work and the American Society for Transplantation and Cellular Therapy. She is passionate about providing psychosocial and emotional support to BMT patients and families throughout the transplant continuum. So without further ado, I would like to get the educational part of our program started. Welcome, Christina. Thank you for having me. Um, I am very passionate about this topic, so I'm very excited to present today. Um, and this is really uh, an introduction to what survivorship really means. And, and so there's a lot of things that may or may not be covered, and so we will hopefully answer your questions. But please write your questions down and we'll get to them at the end. So what does survivorship mean? So there's many definitions. Survivorship is the state of being a survivor, a person who survives, especially a person who remains alive after an event in which others have died, a person who copes well with difficulties, and continue to live or exist, especially in spite of danger or hardship. Now that's very dry. I think survivorship is to beat the odds, one with great courage and strength and a true inspiration. So as we know, we've gotten a little bit better over the years with transplant. And so the CIBMTR, the Center for International Blood and Marrow Transplant Research, estimates that in 2030, there will be over half a million BMT survivors in the United States. And that's a big difference from 2009. So now what? So goals of survivorship care are to empower you to take ownership of your care so that we give you the right information you need, give you, help you motivate to stay healthy, and give you the tools to be successful. So education about late effects in survivorship is really a, a, a big push lately in the grand scheme of cancer in general but especially for BMT because there's a lot of things we need to watch for. We watch for disease recurrence, side effects of the transplant and the treatment, screening and prevention of other cancers, routine health maintenance, psychosocial support, rehabilitation, there is financial counseling and reintegration into society, which means when do I go back to work or should I go back to school? So some of the big things that we worry about in survivorship after transplant is cardiovascular disease. So this is one of the biggest diseases in the country, regardless of whether you've had a transplant or not, but we do know that our patients have an increased risk for other reasons, like chemotherapy and radiation that can affect the heart and the vessels, medications that you may be on for either the transplant itself or side effects like graft versus host disease. Those medications can increase your risk of metabolic syndrome. So that is a big syndrome that's um, related to having high blood pressure, diabetes, and high cholesterol, which can increase your risk of having heart attacks or strokes. So we want to try and prevent that. So how do we screen for it to begin with? So health history. So have you ever had a heart issue in the past, even before the transplant? Does your family have it, an increased risk of um, heart disease? Have you had family members who have died from heart disease or been sick from heart disease? We screen for cholesterol at least every year, but if more often if you start treatment or if there's a risk factor like a new medication. Blood pressure monitoring. We ask patients to check their blood pressures at home while they're on certain medications but could potentially continue to monitor even after that if they are found to have high blood pressure or if we are treating for high blood pressure. So how do we fix what we can fix? So not everything can be changed. So the fact that you had to have chemotherapy and radiation, I can't fix that. The fact that you had to 
you had a heart attack when you were 50. I can't change that either. But what we can do is try and decrease our risk by changing the things that we can change. So the recommended diet that we recommend here is the Mediterranean diet or the DASH diet. So the DASH diet is specifically looking at salt per day, and they recommend less than 2.4 grams of salt per day. They recommend exercising, aerobic, which means getting your heart rate elevated, for 30 minutes most days of the week. They want you to maintain a healthy weight, getting your cholesterol under control, and getting your blood pressure with a goal of less than 140 over 90. Now that's as much as possible. We know we can't do everything. We use certain um, criteria to determine how risky you are based on what your other risk factors are. So the big thing with diet is making sure that you are getting lean protein. So they do recommend more fish and more chicken over red meat and pork. And getting fruits and vegetables and complex carbohydrates. So when you're doing your carbohydrates, a lot of people ask, well, what about breads and potatoes and those kind of things? So you want to focus on whole grain breads, um, potatoes that are not fried, et cetera. Bone health is another big issue after transplant. And what we watch for is decreased bone density. And that can increase your risk of having a broken bone with or without an injury. So falls can definitely increase your risk of having a break. But sometimes people can just walk down the street and their bones can break. Vitamin deficiency, especially vitamin D deficiency, is a big factor in bone health. If you are postmenopausal, your estrogen level goes down, which increases your risk of losing bone mass. Decreased activity. All of our a lot of our patients have less activity after transplant because of fatigue and pain and other issues. And so that can affect bone health. Some certain diseases, like multiple myeloma, affect the bone density in and of itself or can increase your risk of having a bone fracture because of the disease. If you've had radiation to certain areas, that can weaken bone. And steroids. So we use steroids a lot in not only the treatment of an underlying disease, but also to treat graft versus host disease. So how do we screen for bone? Every two years, we do a bone density. This is not a bone marrow biopsy. Everybody asks me that question. It's not, I promise. What it is is it's almost like a little x-ray, and they check your ankle, they check your hips and your lower back, and check and see how dense your bones are and if you're at risk for breaking ones. And we do check a vitamin D level to make sure that you are um, not deficient. You need vitamin D in your diet and in your blood in order to get the calcium into the bone and help strengthen the bone. Now, I live in Ohio, and I will tell you that we don't get that much sun most of the year. And when we do, um, it's not typically enough to get that vitamin D level up. So we do recommend supplements. And especially for those patients um, who have graft versus host disease of the skin, we really don't want you in the sun at all because that can increase the risk of graft versus host disease. So we recommend, oh, sorry about that, everyone, um, at least 2,000 units a day. But if you are deficient, then we will increase that. Typically, it starts at 50,000 units once a week. Um, and then we will increase or decrease depending on how you are re when you're rechecked what it looks like. Weight-bearing exercise. So what that means is not lifting weights in the gym, but walking. So your heel has to strike the pavement to help strengthen the bones. Swimming is a wonderful aerobic exercise that helps in other ways, especially, remember from the beginning, the cardiovascular health. But it doesn't help your bones. So walking, heel strikes, running, those are things that will help. And then if you need to, there are bisphosphonates 
which is a kind of medication that helps build the, the bones up. Um, and there's, these are the generics, the alendronic acid and the zolendronic acid, which are Forteo, Fosamax, uh, Zometa, and um, Reclass are some of them. So endocrine function is also something that's affected by transplant long term. The glands that regulate sleep function, sleep, sexual function, metabolism, growth, hormones, all those things can be affected by radiation, chemotherapy, steroids, et cetera. And so how do we screen um, or some of the diseases that are caused by endocrine dysfunction is diabetes, depression or anxiety, infertility, menopause, decreasing your sexual libido, so that means your desire is lower, insomnia, which is difficulty sleeping, and fatigue. So how do we screen for those abnormal functions? So we lab, we get labs once a year specifically to look at those. So the TSH is a thyroid check. If you have an abnormal thyroid, you can have depression, anxiety, excessive thirst or hunger, intolerance to hot or cold. We do fasting blood sugars or a hemoglobin A1C to check you for um, diabetes, which can be increased risk if you have if you, graft versus host and you're on steroids. We do testosterone levels and LH and FSH, which are the reproductive hormones. A lot of our patients are, are infertile after transplant, which means that they don't have the ability to make those sperms and the eggs that are needed. Um, but it would, can also mean that we push people into menopause or by having an abnormal testosterone level in males, we can make people very tired, um, and then their sexual needs and wants are different, and that can be very distressing. And so sometimes we do have to send patients to specialists or to counseling to discuss and, and to process changes. And sometimes people need supplemental hormones to make um, certain symptoms go away. We do use endocrinologists a lot to help manage some of these more complicated diseases because it's... Um, not one of our specialties. So graft versus host disease is a unique complication of allogeneic stem cell transplants. So this is typically not seen in an autologous transplant, though it can, and it affects many organs, really any of the organs, skin, GI tract, liver, lungs, connective tissue, fascia, vaginal areas and vulva, muscles, mouth, eyes, etc. And it can really affect people's quality of life can impact your daily activity. And because graft versus host disease functions um, as an autoimmune disease of, of a sort, so it means that the immune system is always revved up and fighting and doing something it's not supposed to, we increase our risk of seeing other complications like secondary cancer, so skin cancer, et cetera, and then treatment can increase those risks of late effects like heart disease because as you know, steroids have a lot of good things about them and a lot of bad things about them. So we also see the increased risk of blood clots, and those might be something you notice in your legs. You have extra swelling or pain and redness, and you would want to get that checked out right away. Some of the symptoms we watch for in our appointments are skin and joint tightness. So you used to be able to reach the can on the top shelf, and now you can't get there. I can't get my shoulder high enough. That could be some sign of graft versus host disease. Muscle pain and cramping. It may not be that you just, you know, pull the muscle. You may have a little graft versus host disease. Dry, itching, burning eyes. Dry mouth, with or without sores. Changes in appetite. Weight loss. Bowel changes. So you may not have diarrhea every day, but you have diarrhea three times a week, and it's not really associated to anything you're eating. Shortness of breath with a dry hacking cough, that can be lung involvement. And then vaginal dryness or pain with intercourse. Um, that can be vaginal graft versus host disease. So there's lots of treatments. Topical steroids are what we start with if we can. So there's creams for the skin. We use beclomethazone and budesonide for the GI tract, and that's a, something you drink and, some, and a pill. Um, oral steroid rinses, so for your mouth that can help treat the mouth just at that site. 
If that doesn't work, then we have to increase the steroids by giving you either pills or giving you IV steroids. And those are long treatments. They can typically take about three to four months to taper off of those safely. So we don't just stop those medications. Other medications are ibrutinib, which is a medication that is FDA approved for the treatment of chronic graft versus host disease. Extraoral photosphoresis, which is an IV treatment once, or sorry, twice a week. And the reason I say it's an IV treatment, it's really not giving you anything. It's a way of treating the blood outside of the body. So they take about two to three ounces of blood out of your body, filter it, or send it through a machine that exposes it to UV light and then puts it back in you and that treats the and turns off the B and T cells. Other medications that have been tried, ruxolitinib, uh, rituximab, bortezomib, et cetera, these are all medications that have been tried over the course of many, many years. Um, there is no indication according to the FDA, but we have seen them and some have been very useful to some patients. Unfortunately, one size does not fit all, and we do not have the perfect concoction yet. We're hoping, but that's why we encourage patients to participate in clinical trials, because that's the only way we're going to learn. Steroids are wonderful, and they're also terrible. So steroids can really, about 50% of patients will respond to steroid treatment, and the side effects, though, are we gain weight, especially in our gut, which can increase the pressure on our hearts and increase heart disease and diabetes, decreases bone density, so increases your risk of fractures, irritability and moodiness, insomnia, so people can be very emotional during steroids, especially the higher doses. Um, and sometimes we do have to use anti-anxiety medications to help people through that. Um, some people have a very severe anxiety and what we call psychosis. And in those patients, we really try to taper them off the steroids as quickly as we can safely, and then really try to avoid steroids in the future because it can be very distressing for families and for patients when they get that emotionally labile. Um, you can lose a lot of muscles when you're on steroids. These aren't the steroids that Arnold Schwarzenegger uses to get really big and bulky. Um, this is the steroids that will make those muscles weaker, especially the thigh muscles. So doing stairs can be much more difficult because those big thigh muscles are what you need to do that. Second cancers that we will screen for, breast cancer. We see some squamous cell carcinomas, which is a fancy long word for mouth cancer, throat cancer, skin cancer, and esophageal cancer. We screen for colorectal cancer and cervical cancers. And these are actually cancers that most general practitioners will screen for. So how do we do breast cancer, for example? Mammograms every year. Cervical cancer screenings are pap smears every year. Colonoscopies every 10 years, unless there are polyps or unless a family history or personal history of polyps. And then they tend to be more often because polyps could potentially lead to colon cancer. Prostate cancer screening starts at 40, but it's with the primary care provider discussion. It's not one size fits all also on prostate cancer screening. And then dental exams. So every six months, you want to get your mouth checked, even if you don't have teeth, because they can do really good gum checks, make sure those are healthy, and then they'll look for any signs of cancer in your mouth. Skin cancers are also one we check. I will do a very detailed skin exam every year, but I do recommend that patients look at their moles, look at their freckles, look at their skin, and, and monitor for not just graft versus host disease, but also for any abnormal changes in those moles. So if they go from a nice circular one color mole and all of a sudden it starts changing shape and changing color and it starts to bleed, that would be very abnormal. And you would want to talk to your provider and get that checked out quickly. So what to report? Abnormal skin lesions, bleeding with intercourse, pain with intercourse, blood in your stool or in your urine, abdominal pain. If you feel like food gets stuck in your throat when you're swallowing, 
if you get a lump from your breast or leaking from your nipples, if you have mouth sores, difficulty urinating, any of those symptoms, you would want to call and get checked out. So one of the other things that we really do talk about, and I'm going to touch on it, but I'm sure that um, my colleagues will touch on it a little bit more, is anxiety and depression. Unfortunately, we do have some patients who get post-traumatic stress disorder after transplant. This is a really big deal. Transplant is huge. Not only did you have a diagnosis of cancer, but then you had to get all the treatment to get you to a transplant. And the transplant is more chemotherapy, inpatient stay, you feel terrible, and it's a long recovery. So you think, oh, it should be done, I should be great. But unfortunately, it's not always the case. And then some people, everything is such a whirlwind. You do everything. Six months later, you wake up and go, what just happened? And that can manifest. You can have the difficulty getting out of bed, having difficulty enjoying your activities, having sleeping issues not being able to sleep, or sleeping too much. You just don't feel like you want to be with anybody. Some people get suicidal where they feel like they just want to be done, and that is not normal, and we would want to help you with that. That's something that we would need to address. And I don't, unfortunately don't have how many this patients this affects. I do know um, that I see it enough that I tell every patient to call me if there's any issues, because we can help. First thing we always do is rule out a physical cause of those symptoms. So we check your thyroid, just like we talked about earlier. That can cause depression and anxiety. We check and see how you're doing. And then we connect you with social workers, psychiatry, psychology, support groups. We talk. We have you seen as, as often as you need to because we want to make sure that not only is your body healthy, but your mental health is also there. So treatment summaries are given to patients periodically after transplant. And really that is a summary of everything that's happened to you. So chemotherapies you've had, graft versus host disease, transplant information, infection, any readmission, sort of what the next step is. So what am I going to do next? And this is one of the examples that I use. So this will give you what's going to happen when and what, who should be doing it and around the time and when it's due. And yours may look a little different from your friends who had their transplant across the country, um, but a lot of the same information should still be there. So always remember that you are amazing to have done what you have done. This is a big deal, and it's a lot of work and effort on you and your caregiver. And we are always here to help you get stronger and healthier and to keep you that way. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them at the end. I'm going to pass it on to my colleague. Amanda? Hi, good afternoon. This is Amanda Budai. I'm a social worker um, at UPMC Hillman Cancer Centers, and I've been in the stem cell transplant unit for about, it'll be 12 years in January. Um, so today I'm going to talk with you about continued survivorship, uh, some psychosocial aspects of survivorship, and also uh, two modalities that hopeful, hopefully will be helpful in um, combating some of the issues that we see um, in survivorship. So the goal, identify aspects of survivorship, both positive and negative, uh, because there's always good in every situation. So we'll talk about that briefly. And then again, the two modalities that can be used um, to deal with these aspects of survivorship. And I always like to have, you know, when I go to a conference or hear a lecture, to have something to take home with you today. So I'm hopeful that some of the things that you learn about today, you can either start using immediately, or these are other things that you could maybe research more and find something that might be helpful to you. So survivorship, when we talk about that, we talk about survivorship starting the day of diagnosis. Um, so I know with transplant we talk about day 30, day 100, one, one year post-transplant, but really survivorship we're talking about um, day of diagnosis. So a lot of the examples I'll give are really post-transplant. Um, 
within that first 100 days and then within um, one year and beyond. But I, I thought that this quote was pretty interesting. It's estimated that at two years after stem cell transplant, more than 25% of survivors have ongoing bothersome medical symptoms. And I think Christina did a good job of, of discussing that um, and, and all the things that can be happening with folks. So let's talk about some positive aspects of, oh, I'm sorry, I think I skipped a, no, I didn't, sorry. Um, some positive aspects of survivorship. So we see with our folks, you know, a positive appreciation of friends and family. Um, you know, families grow closer together often after a crisis, and having a transplant is certainly considered a crisis. Um, feeling of being a stronger person, and again, I think Christina's last slide really emphasized that, um, that, that our patients and caregivers do feel a sense that they are a stronger person. They never thought that they could get through this, but now look at them. Um, a strong need to give back. A lot of our volunteers here at Hillman are our patients, um, and they come to us and say, you know, you guys did so much for me. I want to give back. I want to help the other patients. So we see that a lot um, as well. And just a change in priorities. You know, I think we're all good at saying, oh, I'll worry about that tomorrow. Yeah, someday I'm going to do that. Whereas our patients and families often um, feel like, no, we're going we're gonna to schedule the vacation now because, you know, we just don't know. Um, and I know, you know, the patients and families who are listening to this, uh, you know, I know that I'm, I'm preaching to the choir and you guys know this stuff. But just as kind of a refresher of, of these, these things that happen that are positive. Um, and difficult decisions are easier to make. You know, we have... You, patients who were in jobs that they hated and they got through transplant and quit that job and did something that they loved. Um, so those are all good things that happen um, with transplant. So unfortunately, the, the list of negative aspects of transplant is a little bit longer than the positive. Um, so, you know, a list of things, and again, some of these things that I'm talking about are things that happen within the 100 days. Like I have on here a desire to return home, and our folks who um, have to stay locally after transplant, this is very challenging. If, if you guys have been there, you know this. Um, you just want to be at home. Um, and, you know, we work with our folks to, to get them through that difficult time. Um, conflict between patients and families. This is a huge issue, you know, between our patients and our caregivers or just general family members. Um, so this, this is something that happens. Caregiver stress, you know, I always talk about how we, we focus so much on the patients but sometimes forget about our caregivers and we say that it takes a village to get through transplants. So we need to make sure that we're taking care of our caregivers um, and doing whatever we can to help, help with stress. And, and I'm hoping what I talk about next is is going to be helpful to our caregivers as well. Um, loss of income and employment. You know, I, I think when talking about this, I think that sometimes our physicians are very black and white about when people can return to work. Um, but for instance, you know, we have patients who maybe they shouldn't be going back to work because they're still on the immunosuppressive drugs but their insurance is going to term if they don't go back next month. So there's that struggle with patients about what to do and, and being safe and, and doing the right thing medically, but also taking care of, you know, financially taking care of themselves and their family and their insurance. And this is a conflict for, for folks. Um, so kind of working with, with patients and the medical team to come up with a compromise. Um, but this is a huge stressor. And again, we're talking about a stressor on top of, of being stressed with medical conditions. Um, you know, loss of routine with children, that's a whole other lecture that we can talk about, but this is something that's, that's very important um, in survivorship is, is working with our, our patients and families' children to make sure that they are well taken care of. You know, again, our folks who have to stay locally, their children are back at home being cared for by other family members and friends, this is a huge disruption um, to, to that family system. So kind of keeping, keeping tabs on the kids as well. Um, appearance and sexuality I'll talk about um, in the next slide as well. Um, so a lot of these negative aspects, some are practical things, like I talked about, um, you know, income and work, and some of them are emotional, like the depression and the anxiety. Um, so, you know, just some, some ways to, to deal with those issues. 
So talking about sexuality, you know, the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society actually has a really, really good article on their website that you can download or read. But you know, sexuality, when we talk about that, it encompasses physical, psychological, social, emotional, and spiritual factors to that. It's not just a physical act. So I know talking about graft versus host disease, that is a huge component um, to people's sexuality if they're experiencing that. But also, it is a psychological aspect to it. Um, and, you know, sexuality is, you know, physical intimacy. And we talk with folks who can't maybe um, be intimate in that way, talking about other ways to be intimate with each other, you know, still holding hands or snuggling, those kinds of things that can still show intimacy, even if it's not um, intercourse. Um, and the other issue with that, you know, we talk about, you know, I've talked with couples kind of about sexuality and how that presents itself after transplant. But another population that is dealing with this in a very different way are our young adults who are in the dating scene or were in the dating scene prior to um, diagnosis and transplant, and now they're trying to get back out there. And their appearance may be different because of high dose steroids, you know, alopecia, things like that. So, you know, this is, this is a challenge for, for those folks. And I think all of us, no matter how much we say, oh, my appearance doesn't matter, it does to some level. It is part of who we are. So when we're, we're not what we think we should look like and we're, that's what we're presenting to the world, that can, that can be a real challenge. Um, so I think that's a unique population that's dealing with sexuality in, in maybe a different way. Um, so I think that the team's role in this is really, you know, we encourage patients and families to be open with, with the medical team, with the social workers. And I know this is so hard to do. This is that, that area that nobody really wants to talk about, kind of the elephant in the room. Um, but really having that open conversation with, with your healthcare providers. I know Dr. M runs our GVH clinic here, and she's excellent about dealing with these issues. Um, you know, so just kinda, kind of bringing the team into that role and seeing what we can do to help out with that. So I'm going to switch topics a little bit to talk about two modalities to reduce stress. So all the negative things we just talked about, um, what are some ways that we can deal with that? Um, and the two things that I'm going to talk about are meditation and mindfulness. And I also do want to say, you know, Christine talked about depression and anxiety. Um, and, you know, if you do feel like you're having depression or anxiety, um, even if it is just situational, but I think it's it's time to kind of bring in the team if you feel like your symptoms are interfering with your daily activities. I think that's a really good gauge to say, you know what, I'm, I'm feeling depressed more days than not in a month, or, you know, I'm eating more, eating less, not enjoying things. If that starts to become the norm and that's interfering with your daily activities, then I think it's time to, um, to talk to your healthcare team about this. Um, and certainly, you know, if you are experiencing that, that degree of depression or anxiety, these modalities still can work, but may need to get some um, additional resources on board. So we're going to talk about um, meditation and mindfulness. Um, and these are two areas that can help with stress of caregivers and survivorship. So meditation is, is difficult, and I am starting with that one, which is a little bit more difficult, and then we'll go into mindfulness. So meditation, to engage in mental exercise, so, such as concentration on one's breathing, a repetition of a mantra for the purpose of reaching a, higher, a heightened sense of spiritual awareness. Um, so Buddhists use meditation to reach nirvana, but meditation doesn't have to have a spiritual aspect to it. Um, it can and it does in many, many faiths and religion. You know, Catholicism uses the rosary, and that is a form of meditation. Um, but it doesn't have to have that, that spiritual component to it. I mentioned, you know, the word, the a mantra, and that's a repetition of a meaningless word. Um, again, to, to kind of quiet your mind. Um, the most common one is OM, which is O-M. Um, also, prayer beads can be used. And, I, you know, the picture of the Dalai Lama and Mother Teresa using uh, prayer beads for, for meditation. Also, music can be used to kind of help with, with meditation as well. So the purpose is to clear your mind of intrusive thoughts. So that's the whole purpose of meditation, is that you are completely in the present and your mind is cleared. Now I will say again, meditation is not something that you can just start doing and you're really good at it today. You know, I kind of um, compare it to playing a musical instrument. It, t it takes a lot of practice to, to do meditation, but that doesn't mean that there's not benefit to it on day one. So it is, the, the goals of this are similar to mindfulness. The purpose is to stay in the present, no regret for p mistakes made in the past, and not worrying about the future. 
not that those things aren't happening, but for this minute right now to just be present in the, in the, in the moment. Um, and again, this is, this is challenging to do. And there are guided imagery medica meditations as well that people use, um, but a lot of them focus on breathing. And this does bring, you know, the goal of relaxation. So the pitfalls besides meditation being difficult is sleep. Um, I read one uh, Buddhist student said that his master would have him sit on the side of a well so that he couldn't fall asleep because he would fall into the well. Um, so you don't want to lay down when you're, when you're meditating. You want to sit up in a comfortable position. Wandering thoughts, I think, are the biggest pitfall for meditation. It is very easy when we close our eyes to start the list. I need to do this today, A, B, and C is happening. Oh, I should have done that. That conversation with my husband didn't go well this morning. It's very easy for thoughts to wander. And it's very easy to then criticize yourself and say, look, I'm not doing this right and getting frustrated. Instead, to acknowledge that you're having those thoughts and let them pass and continue. Again, that is what takes practice, is to allowing yourself um, you know, permission to, to have those wandering thoughts, but then bringing yourself back to the center. Um, so permit yourself to, to, to make those mistakes. So how do we meditate? And at the end of the, the um, slides, I have some resources for some apps that are helpful with meditation. Um, but you're focusing on, on the breathing, and, and there's many ways to do this. And you really want to focus and feel what does the breath feel like going into your lungs and into your belly and then back out of your nose and mouth. How does that feel? Really concentrating on that. Um, and notice that your, your lungs and belly are expanding. Um, you know, another, another way to do this breathing is to kind of start at the bottom of your body in your toes and kind of, again, it's an imagery. Imagine the breath going from your toes to the crown of your head and back down again. And just moving up your body and continuously doing that up and down um, to kind of imagine that flow of air going through you. Um, another one to do is to, to do, they call it left-right breathing, where you imagine that just your right lung is inhaling. Now, both of your lungs are definitely inhaling, but to focus on the right lung and focus on that one being expanded and then moving to the left. And again, these are just ways to focus on that breathing. Um, and the, uh, the last one that, that I find really helpful is if you take a very deep inhale and kind of exhale half of it, pause for a second, and then exhale the other half to really get a very deep breath and then a complete exhale. So those are, those are some um, ways to kind of keep your um, keep the breathing focused on your body. So there's many benefits to meditation. Um, reduce stress, gain insight, um, increase atten atten uh, excuse me, attention to others' well-being, and reducing the symptoms of depression and anxiety. There's also some medical, um, reducing pain, insomnia, hypertension, all of these things. And really slowing down your brain. Again, you know, I feel like our patients and families are dealing with a million things at one time coming at them, not just with their, you know, diagnosis, but, you know, also with just life that we're all dealing with. So kind of slowing down your brain for a minute to give it a sense to catch up. So mindfulness um, is easier than meditation, and it's just being fully present and aware of our society, of our surroundings. So meditation requires you know, to, to be quiet and alone, um, whereas mindfulness you can do anywhere. You can be doing it while driving, while you're sitting here listening to this lecture. Are you just focusing on the lecture, or are you also looking at your phone and someone walked in the room? So really focusing your attention on just what's happening right now. And again, this is, I say, easier than meditation, but it certainly isn't by any means easy. And I think especially in our society, we've kind of um, gotten away from just focusing on the here and now. We're really good at um, multitasking. And when I say we're really good at that, I mean that we do it all the time. Um, but are we really doing what we need to be doing? Um, I can give an example where I was super crazy last week. I dropped off papers in the physician's office to be signed. I was doing a million other things. The next day, I could not remember what happened to that paperwork. I did find it, and everything was fine. But it's when you're doing a million things at one time, you're not concentrating or focusing on anything. So then everything is sort of mishmashed and not done well. 
So kind of taking time, um, not being reactive or overwhelmed by what is happening to us, but taking a minute to really process what's, what's happening, paying attention, accepting ourselves for who we are. Um, these are all things that mindfulness can do for us. And again, we can do it any time. You know, when's the last time you drove to work and remember getting there? I mean, I've driven to work and all of a sudden I'm there and I have no recollection of the drive. I think we've all done that. Um, but really focusing on, on driving to work. And it's hard. You know, if, you, if I say, on your way home tonight, turn off the radio and just focus on driving, I, I guarantee you're probably going to say that you're really bored. But really take everything in um, and just, again, be very present. So I found this old picture, um, which I also found in researching. This is called a gossip bench. I don't know, you know, however old you are, if your mother, grandmother, great-grandmother had one of these. But basically it is what it is. I called it a telephone stand. And my grandma had one in her house, and she would sit on the phone all the time and talk on the phone. And I put this picture here because I think how often do we actually sit and just talk to someone and not have a million other things going on? Um, you know, how often are we, again, looking down at our phone? And I think that it's great that we have, you know, we can keep in contact with people through text, but really paying attention to what you're doing right this second and just enjoying things. You know, not eating lunch while we're watching TV or at the desk working, you know, taking a minute to really um, enjoy things. I'm thinking, you know, if you had a conversation with someone on the phone, but you're making lunches for tomorrow and you're making dinner and folding laundry, did you really enjoy that conversation with the person, or was it just something that you, you moved through and you went through while you're doing a million other things? So I think that, the, I mean, the purpose of me saying all this is just I think when we're, we're just focused on the present and with the people that we're with right now, I feel like there is a sense of calm, and it does reduce depression and anxiety. Um, and, the, and things like cognitive, you know, again, you're paying attention to what you're doing, so then that's going to help you to remember things. So I think that there is a, is a bonus to this mindfulness. Um, and it is kind of a buzzword right now. I, I know that that's kind of the big, the big thing, but there's benefit to it um, and, and just enjoying what's happening right now. And conversely, you know, having a bad time right this second, but taking that in as well and allowing yourself to process what's happening with, with the here and now, even if it is a bad experience, um, so that you can process that and work through it as well. So I did include some references. Um, and again, the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society article is there. And then these apps are, you know, some of them are free. The Headspace one, I recently looked into that one. That one is nice. They have meditations that are, you can pick your time. So it's from five to 10 minutes. Um, and you can schedule it. So you can say, like, after I get out of the shower at 7 o'clock in the morning, a tiny alarm will go off and remind you it's time to do a meditation. And again, it's, it can be as little as five minutes a day, and there is some benefit to that. Um, so thank you so much for your time. Great. Thank you so much. Okay. On to our next speaker. Wonderful. Thanks to Christina and Amanda for that excellent content. So during this final portion of the webinar, I want to focus on moving forward in survivorship and becoming empowered. While there are so many things that may feel out of control as a BMT survivor, there are undoubtedly many things you can control and steps you can take to live your best life post-transplant. Creating good habits can take time and effort, but is worth it. As a BMT survivor, there can be a lot of value in stringing together a number of habits to create daily routines. There's power and predictability, and routines can help create clarity around what's going to happen every day. They can also be very helpful for people struggling with chemo brain. A predictable routine means there is less information that your brain must call to mind. Getting up each day and committing to a routine can help alleviate depressive symptoms in some cases. Behavioral activation is actually a coping strategy that uses goal setting to help people engage in enjoyable activities. And planning and routines can help with this process. You may be thinking that while this all sounds great, it just isn't realistic to develop routines as a BMT survivor given the lack of predictability that's inherent in going through a transplant. This is a fair assessment, 
and it's a reason why it's key to develop a plan that works for you. The first step in developing a daily routine is actually giving yourself space to grieve the losses that you've experienced and the things that have changed. You may not have the physical ability to exercise the way you used to, or may have medical restrictions that keep you from activities you love, such as gardening or going to parties. These losses can be significant, and it's really important to tend to them. Next, you want to assess what is doable. What are the restrictions on your day? Do you have regular clinic appointments you need to go to? What's your energy level like right now? What kind of transportation is accessible to you? Answering those types of questions will help you develop a routine that matches your current lifestyle and capabilities. So with that information, you can create a daily routine, put it into place, try your best to stick to it, and course correct as needed. And of course, remember to celebrate your successes along the way. Managing med medication is a significant part of BMT survivorship and likely going to be an important part of your daily routine as a transplant survivor. Many patients leave the hospital after transplant on between 20 and 40 medications. And while your doctor is prescribing those meds, once home, the patient is responsible for taking them. So this is actually a great opportunity to take the reins on an incredibly important aspect of getting healthy. Medication schedules can be complex and overwhelming. Make sure you understand what medications you're on and when to take them. It's absolutely okay to tell your doctor or a nurse that you need to spend some time reviewing your medications with them so that you feel comfortable with the plan. Depending on how much medication you take, you may need your caregiver to help you remember when to take things or even help with the administration of certain types of medication. Lastly, get creative when figuring out ways to manage your medications. There are apps that are designed to remind you when to take meds, or you can even just use a simple alarm on your phone. Some patients use things like whiteboards or chalkboards to keep track of when they've taken meds. And one patient I worked with even had this elaborate system of setting up her medications in labeled paper cups every day. It worked well for her, and some creativity will help you find what works best for you. Diet and nutrition is another area where BMT survivors can make an impact on their health. Ultimately, you control what you put in your body and can make good choices to support your recovery post-transplant. This can get complicated for many patients, however, because while our bodies need vitamins and nutrients from food, many patients post-transplant don't have much of an appetite or don't enjoy eating because things don't taste very good. It becomes a challenge when a patient needs to eat to live rather than live to eat. However, there are some things you can do to make it work. The most important thing is to follow the recommendations of your medical team regarding what type of diet is recommended. This may include restrictions on certain foods that aren't safe for you if you're immune compromised. You can also ask your doctor for a referral to a dietitian. Trying lots of different textures and temperatures and tastes may help you find the food that's most palatable, and adding fillers like milk or protein powder to food can help increase your overall caloric intake. A trained dietitian can help you create an eating plan that works. This is another area where it's important to ask for help. Friends and family members can get involved in cooking meals and preparing food for you, and it's important to be really specific about what kind of foods you can eat, and probably more importantly, what you like. In addition to nutrition, exercise is, of course, an important part of healing post-transplant. We heard about that earlier in the webinar. Developing an exercise routine can enhance both your physical and your mental health. Exercise is likely to look different than it did before transplant. Depending on your energy, physical capabilities, and any restrictions you may need, <clears throat> you may need to adjust from the routine that you had prior to getting sick or prior to having transplant. It's important to take it slow when you're getting back into exercise after you've been sick. And take frequent breaks. Building in rest is a really important aspect of getting exercise. It's also helpful to try 
different things and find out what works for you. It could be just gentle stretching, followed by a walk around the house, or perhaps you have a stationary bike to ride or some light weights that you can lift. Finding what's enjoyable and doable will increase the likelihood that you can stick with it. If you haven't already, you may want to talk to your doctor about getting a referral to a physical therapist. This can help with identifying where you are physically, what your baseline is, and what types of exercise would be beneficial. Lastly, remember that exercise doesn't always require costly classes or gym memberships. You can find a lot of guidance in things like yoga poses and um, online if you have access to the internet. Another aspect of life that is really important to health post-transplant is sleep. Poor sleep can lead to low energy, stress, and depression, which then can in turn cause difficulty sleeping. The good news is that even with this cycle and things like medication side effects and pain that may disrupt sleep post-transplant, there are some strategies to help. First, be sure to tell your doctor if you're having difficulty sleeping. It's really important and there may be interventions that she or he can recommend for you. Depending on your situation, your doctor may even request that you see a specialist, such as, such as an endocrinologist or someone who knows more about sleep. Beyond medical intervention, there are things to try in order to improve sleep. Using meditation, as Amanda talked about, can often induce sleep, even though not, that's not what it's intended for, or just calming music at night can help you fall asleep. Paying attention to your sleep patterns in general and building in naps during the day may also help. It's also important to practice good sleep hygiene. So that means things like creating a calming, predictable nightly routine, buying cozy pajamas and sheets that you look forward to climbing into, turning off your screens long before going to bed, so turning off the TV and putting away your phone, and then trying to have a consistent sleep pattern, so going to bed at about the same time every night and waking at about the same time every morning. Good habits can help tremendously as you move through survivorship. Now let's discuss some additional ways you can be empowered to take charge of your life. Staying healthy emotionally is challenging following transplant. Amanda talked about a lot of the difficult things that can occur for people after going through something as major as a bone marrow transplant. Lots of patients deal with anxiety and depression. So because of the strong connection between thoughts, emotions, and behaviors, as you see on the screen, it can really be helpful to recognize patterns of thinking that you may have that aren't serving you well. All or nothing thinking or thinking in extremes like you're either a success or you're a failure and there's no gray area is one such pattern. Overgeneralizing or assuming something is always this way is another one. Jumping to conclusions about something without actual evidence is also a common distortion in thinking that can impact your emotional health. By recognizing any of these patterns in yourself and replacing these types of thoughts you can improve your emotional health and actually feel better. Consider using a thought log to track and shift some of these patterns. Simply write down an event that occurred, how you thought about it, the resulting feelings or emotions that came up when you had that thought, and then an alternative way of thinking that may lead to different feelings. So for example, say you were supposed to get results on a scan that you had yesterday and you haven't heard from the clinic yet, so it's been a day since you were supposed to hear back on that scan. The negative thought that occurs is something's wrong. Something is wrong with my results. Of course, that leads to anxiety. That can cause racing thoughts, feeling a knot in your stomach, uh, muscle tension, pr pretty unpleasant reactions. To counter that negative thought, a more rational thought would be, my doctor would call me immediately if something was really wrong or urgent. The clinic must be busy today. A therapist or trained counselor can help guide the process of thought restructuring as, as part of therapy or seeing, seeing a counselor. So consider that intervention if you're struggling with depression or anxiety. 
As a BMT survivor, one of the other things that can feel incredibly empowering is to find ways to make meaning out of what's happened. Taking stock of your relationships with others and investing in those that you love, as well as examining areas where you've grown and changed through the process, can help bring your awareness to some of those positive aspects of bone marrow transplant. It can also feel good to volunteer to help others or simply tap into your creative side and express yourself through things like dance, music, or art. By exploring new ways to express who you are, you may learn new things about yourself and find enjoyment in creative endeavors. It's not about achieving or possessing specific talent, but rather exploring and learning through expression. Writing is another good way to express yourself in survivorship. Writing may help reconnect you with who you were before transplant and connect you with who you are today. Writing doesn't need to be difficult. Consider a few of these easy strategies to get started. First, try the right method. Write stands for what, reflect, investigate, time, and exit. Simply write down what's on your mind. Reflect a bit on how it makes you feel or what you want. Um, and then investigate those feelings a little further. As you write about this, what emerges for you? What kind of emotions are, are coming up? Time yourself and write for just a set period of time, even as little as five minutes. And then after that time is up, exit by writing a final sentence about what you noticed while going through the writing exercise. Another simple way to start writing is to tune into your senses. Pull out your journal, sit down, and write down what you smell, what you feel, hear, see, or taste at that given moment. Or for an even simpler option, do a free write, where you simply write down anything and everything that comes to mind. No rules, no parameters. If you like more structure, clustering or mind mapping is a good option. You can start by just putting one word in a circle on the page, like transplant, and then from there drawing branches to other concepts or words that are related, and just keep branching out. One final idea is to write a letter, maybe to a loved one, your transplant team, or perhaps even to your pre-transplant self. You don't need to send the letter necessarily. It may just be a vehicle for expressing gratitude, joy, anger, or some other kind of emotion. I want to conclude by highlighting the value of staying connected in survivorship. This can be a good time to invest in relationships that matter to you, some of which may need some attention or repair. Honest and vulnerable communication about what you need and feel can strengthen those relationships and make them more meaningful. For a lot of survivors, reconnecting with their communities or finding new groups of people to connect with is really important. Often people find benefit in getting to know other BMT survivors who may understand what you have been through. And as we heard earlier, NBMT Link has a peer program, as do a number of other organizations. Knowing that you may still have restrictions on how much you can go in public, don't forget about virtual connections and the opportunities to get to know people in online groups on Facebook or to connect with your family and friends through email. And as you do all of this, give yourself grace. Connecting with people again after a life-changing experience like transplant can feel clunky and it may take some time and some effort. To conclude, transplant and the journey of survivorship can absolutely feel like a time of can'ts or don'ts, restrictions, and requirements. However, there are many things you can do to improve your physical and mental health. Finding those things that work for you can shift your experience to one lacking in control to one of empowerment. Thanks, and we'll move to the Q&A. Thank you so much to everyone. This is some great information. And I am going to start the question and answer portion. We are going to do our best to get as many of these as we can. Um, and if you need to uh, end uh, with the webinar, you are welcome to do so. But we are going to uh, try to answer as many of these as we can. So the first question I have it says, I'm 10 years post allo BMT, and my immune system is not kicked in. I receive monthly IVIG infusions, which keep me well and out of the hospital. Is this common, and am I assuming at this point that the immune system is never going to recover? 
what are your thoughts? I'm imagining this is probably for Christina. Uh, yeah, so I think that at this stage, this is going to be chronic and you will continue to need IVIG. It could be part of a, a type of graft versus host disease um, and typically as long as the IVIG is working and you're not getting infections, that's all that needs to happen. Okay, great, thank you. Um, this one, I'm not sure if you can answer it, but I will see. Uh, it says, what percentage of the allo transplant patients and their caregivers experience PTSD symptoms during the first year post-transplant, and what can be offered to support caregivers and patients with post-traumatic stress disorder? And so anyone who wants to join in on that one, feel free. Hi, this is Katie. I can um, speak to this a little bit. The, the research that's emerging on PTSD and bone marrow transplant is still in its pretty early phases. We're, we're realizing what a significant problem this is for patients and for caregivers. So I have seen varying statistics. Um, one article I read said that up to a quarter of BMT patients experience some symptoms of PTSD. So we're learning more and more that it's very real. It's very real for patients. It's very real for caregivers. And so, um, you know, I think one of the most important things is to be aware of the symptoms. Um, you know, people often feel um, a sense of very real anxiety or panic when they encounter things that remind them of the time that they had in the hospital or the day that they were diagnosed. Some people experience nightmares or flashbacks. Those kind of symptoms are something to immediately bring to your physician. And, and one of the most effective ways to deal with PTSD is to see a, a therapist or a counselor, someone who can help unwind some of those really difficult reactions. Um, so that, that would be my recommendation to, number one, assess for the symptoms, be sure to bring them to your doctor, and then seek out counseling or therapy to, to feel better. Great. Thank you, Katie. Okay. Uh, there's another question here. Would you please address brain changes that occur from a stem cell transplant? Um, this is Christina, and I think I, maybe I am going to interpret this question as more of a memory or cognitive issue. Um, and this is also one of those things that is really coming to light now versus 10 years ago. And I think as patients have been reporting more of these memory issues with their providers, we're starting to collect more data. At the clinic, I started doing some screening for some cognitive changes. And we do have speech therapists who help with some of these memory issues. Um, and I know that um, Katie talked about um, a little bit about it and so did Amanda about sort of retraining your brain on how to do your normal daily activities and retrain it so it helps with memory. Um, I don't, some of it has to do with the chemotherapy and radiation, but they've also seen that some patients even have the memory issues before they start treatment, really at the time of diagnosis. So they're still doing a lot of information gathering and a lot of research still is coming. Okay, great. Thank you, Christina. Okay. Um, another uh, person writes in wondering how common is it uh, to have a bone marrow transplant for people with follicular lymphoma? So this is Katie. Good... I wanna... Pardon me. I, I just was going to recommend that for that kind of specific data, um, if you're interested in that, you can go to the CIBMTR website, the Center for International Blood and Marrow Transplant Research, and a lot of that data will be available there on the website, and if it's not, um, you can make a specific request to find out information about um, number of transplants for specific diseases. Okay, great. Thank you so much for that recommendation. 
Uh, another writer uh, sent in, what's your thoughts on a vegan diet for continued health post-transplant? Hi, this is Christina. So there's a lot of questions about which diet would be best. Um, and each person is a little different. I don't think I would recommend one way or another, but just know that if you do decide to become vegan, there are certain nutrients that aren't available in a vegan diet. And so you would want to make sure to talk to a dietitian to make sure that you're getting all of the nutrients you need to make your counts okay. If you have, for example, low iron, um, which is not normally an issue for post-transplant patients uh, due to blood transfusions, but you, you can be deficient in B12 and iron, and that can cause anemia, which means low red blood cells. So you would want to make sure you would do it safely. And um, so that, that's my biggest recommendation. Great. Thank you. Uh, we have another one here, too, uh, probably for you, Christina, that says, I have a low degree of chronic graft-versus-host disease, which is good if my immune system has a better response. However, uh, is it possible for it to get worse over time? So chronic graft-versus-host disease can wax and wane a lot um, over many, many years. Uh, typically, if you can control it with just topicals, then that may be all you see. Sometimes if you need systemic uh, treatments and we start tapering, it can flare up. If you've been the same way you have for a very long time, months to years, then typically that's what you're going to see. It's really time will tell what it's going to look like. Just like with diseases of any kind, you have to watch and wait. OK, great. Also, where do people who have multiple issues related to BMT survivorship find adequate care if they don't live close to an NCI-designated cancer center? And are there any holistic survivorship clinics you are aware of that could help BMT patients with access to cardiologists, endocrinologists, et cetera? I think this is one of the biggest gaps in cancer survivorship and especially transplant survivorship is having people in the community who are comfortable with you and who will take care of you um, and understand what is happening. I work with a lot of really great primary care providers who do help manage a lot of these side effects. And it's a lot of communication with your transplant center. I also provide patients with a lot of information specific to them in their care summary um, and plan. And that helps pro providers locally. I give it also to their primary care provider who can use it as a guide on how to manage long term. The, actually, the Be the Match or the National Maradona Program also has a lot of really good resources for providers not just patients, where they can go and look at the information itself. Really, you just have to have, find someone who is willing to listen and willing to take you on as a patient. Um, and I really do hope that as we move forward and more patients are surviving this, that holistic survivorship clinics do become the norm and are available to everyone. Great. Thank you. Uh, this one's probably for Amanda or Katie, I'm imagining. What do you do if support services aren't available to you for mental health in the area that you live? This is, well, this um, is Amanda. Um, I think a lot of agencies now are providing, I know that is a huge um, gap in services, but I, I think that there are a lot of agencies that are providing um, either over the phone social work counseling or groups, um, some um, things that can be done over the phone or through, you know, websites. I, I'm finding more and more agencies are starting to do that. Like I know NMDP is starting those things. Um, Leukemia and Lymphoma has some things. Um, because that is a huge, I know that's a huge gap mental health counseling, in, especially in this population. I don't know, Katie or Jen, if you have anything to add. This is Katie. I, I'll just add that um, you're right, Be The Match does offer counseling to patients who are 
or patients and caregivers, excuse me, anywhere along the, the transplant continuum. And it is over the phone, unless you happen to live in the Minneapolis, St. Paul, Twin Cities area, and then you can come to our offices. Um, but it's very much structured like a, you know, community mental health clinic would be. We offer 50-minute sessions once a week. They're scheduled in advance with a licensed social worker who's got experience in bone marrow transplant. Um, so, you know, we, we do a, a thorough psychosocial assessment with each patient to understand what, what the goals are for counseling and then use a variety of different interventions over the course of counseling. So, um, if, if that is useful to anyone, I would encourage you to contact Be The Match. Thank you both. Okay, uh, there's another question here. When should shortness of breath be taken seriously? Shortness of breath comes with the loss of fitness, so how do you spot the difference as a caregiver or patient on when you should seek medical care? I think that's a really good question. Um, I think shortness of breath should always be taken seriously, and we can check lung functions to see if the lungs are involved in any graphosis disease. And if the function of the lungs is okay, then we look at heart to make sure the heart is okay because everything works together. So you check physical organs and then you check and see how the fitness level is. Because you're right, the fitness, loss of fitness, loss of muscle tone can increase your shortness of breath because it takes more effort to move. I screen patients once a year with pulmonary function tests to make sure that we're not missing anything. But if you're short of breath or if you have a dry cough that's not go getting better, definitely see a healthcare provider so that they can evaluate that. Great. Thank you, Christina. Uh, here we have one from a patient who was saying that every day they were getting better for a while. Uh, but uh, they have GVHD of the lungs, eyes, and skin, and muscles. And now every day it seems like they're getting a little worse and trying to deal with the depression with that. Is there any suggestions? This is Katie. And, and you know, first of all, I just want to acknowledge that that is a normal progression. It makes sense that over time as the physical effects are becoming more difficult or more debilitating or more common that that can increase symptoms of depression and or anxiety. I think, um, you know, a couple of things. Number one, it's important to attend to the medical stuff and ensure that you're getting the care that you need and working closely with your transplant physician or whomever is managing your care to address those, those physical symptoms. And then closely after that, talking to your provider about the depression um, and the symptoms that you're experiencing. You know, a lot, of, a lot of BMT patients find benefit in taking antidepressants or anti-anxiety medication. Um, not everyone, but that's certainly an option and something to talk about with the healthcare team. And then considering getting some counseling, um, whether it's from an organization like Be The Match or the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society or whether it's from a therapist in your community, there really are methods that a, a trained therapist or counselor can help you to learn in order to ease those depressive symptoms even in the midst of really difficult physical symptoms. Great. Thank you, Katie. Um, this one is one I might be uh, attending to more offline, but I'll bring it up in case either of you have uh, recommendations. The cost of eye care when battling eye GDHD is overwhelming, especially when you're on disability. Um, and they're saying how to get financial help for things like the serum eye drops. Do either of you have thoughts on that? Um, this is I wish Amanda. I had something. Um, I don't know anything specifically. I know that those are very expensive. Um, so certainly I don't know if there's a social worker where you're receiving your care that could look into that more with your insurance. I know often when there isn't an answer and there's not help for financially for something specific like the eye drops, kind of finding grants out there that could help with other things like gas cards and things like that so that you could then put 
gas money towards that. I know that's not a great answer, and it's definitely a Band-Aid. Um, but I guess seeing if there's, if there's other funding out there for transplant or for specifically your diagnosis that could, would free up some more money. Um, but I don't know anything, unfortunately, specific for those eye drops. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, just a thought, too. Uh, this person I will be getting to offline, but also Cancer Care, depending, has some great financial assistance and, um, you know, LLS. Uh, and, and then in addition to that, I know there is a Cancer Coalition website that is also designed to help with financial issues. But I will definitely follow up with you uh, this week. Uh, now, there's another person who had asked about elaborating on heart and pulmonary effects with uh, afterwards in survivorship. Um, elaborate. I guess um, we always worry about heart function in general because we do know our patients are at higher risk for heart disease, and so if you have um, a pump that's more weak, and that means that you retain more fluid. You can actually retain fluid in your lungs and then make it difficult to breathe. And those patients will then require some more assistance from cardiology or even from a, a we've managed some of that also within BMT, sometimes uh, giving diuretics and things like that. And then the lungs, could be graft versus host disease, could be infection, could be um, secondary to cancer or chemotherapy and radiation can cause pulmonary effects. And they, because they all work together, you have to look and see what's the underlying cause of the shortness of breath, the coughing, the fluid retention. Um, and over time, that can really impact people's ability to do normal activities. And that is why we keep monitoring forever, because these aren't necessarily things that happen right away within the first year or even two years. We're talking five to 10 years out of transplant. And the longer you live, the more at risk we see patients. And so that's why knowing that we're going to have all these patients coming and surviving and thriving in life, we want to make sure that they're thriving and happy and healthy by keeping control of a blood pressure earlier rather than later and starting a cholesterol-lowering medication earlier rather than later and screening for those breathing tests. We do them once a year to check and make sure that the function of those lungs are still doing well. And why I focus a lot on diet and exercise and because we know that 10, 20 years down the road, you guys are still going to be alive, and we are so thankful, but we want to make sure you're happy and healthy at the same time. Great. Thank you, Christina. Uh, another person has wrote in asking for um, some elaboration with how meditation exactly helps someone deal with pain management. Uh, this is Amanda. I can I can um, talk about that. I think you know through integrative oncology, they're starting to see the benefits of um, meditation dealing with pain. Now, certainly, if you're experiencing significant amount of of pain that needs to be addressed with um, other modalities, um, you know that's obviously indicated. I think more with with a generalized pain. Nothing, you know, if you're having a chronic um, issue. Um, I think definitely need to, to seek medical, medical assistance for that. Great. Thank you. Uh, what about uh, another um, person has asked, where may I find local groups that have survived a bone marrow transplant? This is Katie. I can talk a little bit about this. I'll, I'll say, first of all, it can be challenging to find a local group right in your home community of survivors of transplant because Frankly, it's not all that common, so that can be a challenge for people. However, if you live near either the transplant center where you received your care or even a different transplant center, 
um, it may be worth it to contact them and ask to talk to a BMT social worker and find out if the medical center offers anything specific locally for transplant survivors. Um, in addition, if, if you're open to support groups over the phone or online, some of the big organizations um, that support BMT patients have, have those kind of groups. Um, here at Be The Match, I can say we have a, a group that is available three times a month over the phone. We call them our survivorship chats, and they are um, facilitated by professionals here um, on staff and include people all across the country who have gone through transplant and want to come together and talk about various aspects of survivorship. So um, if that is of interest, you can find detailed information on bethematch.org. All right, um, thank can you, I just Kate. Type, oh, go ahead. Can I just, oh, um, there's also uh, different hospitals may have something, but their fourth angel, which is something that's at the clinic, is actually a national opportunity. If you go online under the fourth angel um, group, they can pair you up with a one-to-one -one person who might be able to give you some um, personal insight on how they did. It's not a group. It's sort of a, a mentorship. Okay. Which also National Bone Marrow Transplant Link also has a peer mentor program, and I know LLS has some great things too. Um, another person asked, how common is chronic graft versus host disease? I'd say about 30% of patients after transplant. Okay, thank you. And uh, we have another writer here that says, any tips to handle negative statistics about survival and outcome? This is Katie. I can address this a little bit. I think, you know, it is something that's difficult for a lot of patients, especially in the age of the Internet when we have access to so much information and can quickly look up um, survival and outcome statistics based on, you know, disease and transplant and all of that. And while there's some value in that, it certainly can cause a lot of anxiety. And I think one of the really important things to keep in mind when it comes to statistics is that they are describing broad populations of people. So if it says, you know, 30% of this broad population of people will experience this, that doesn't translate into I have a 30% chance. It's based on populations. It's used to, to drive big macro decisions in, in you know, what, we, what we do in terms of research and treatment. So I think making somewhat of a separation between you as an individual patient who has so many factors um, within your body and your life and your particular situation and that broad statistical research. Thank you. That's perfect. Okay. Uh, is there a more increased risk of complications if you've had a second transplant? Um, oh, shit. Sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh. Um, so I, I think that's a good question. I think that um, it depends on why you have the second transplant. And I think that all of the same things that you are going to look for with the first transplant, you're going to look for with the second transplant. So um, it's a little like the statistics. I think that you are not a statistic. You are an individual. And so you're going to have to keep in mind um, all the normal things we watch for. But um, And that's, that's what I would recommend. Perfect. How about we have another person here. I've been diagnosed with pulmonary chronic graft versus host disease eight years post-transplant. How common is this, and what does long-term treatment look like? I think it's how um, – I'm sorry, could you repeat was that? Oh, um, sure. Transplant? Basically, eight it's been years. eight years post-transplant, and she got a pulmonary chronic graft-versus-host disease uh, diagnosis. I think that's a good question. Eight years post-transplant is, congratulations, by the way, that is amazing. Um, I do think that some people do get 
graft host disease five to ten years out, even though it's much more co less common. So the longer you get out of transplant, it actually decreases the risk of chronic GVHD. But that being said, um, it does happen, and I would recommend going back to your oncologist to ask. Depending on really what treatment you're getting and how you're responding, I would love to be able to give you a finite time point, but I don't think I have that for you. And that is okay. We know we can't give individual advice, but we can give general ideas to people. Thank you for that. Um, also, do you have any recommendations on where people can get more uh, disease-specific information? We have one writer here who said, that um, they have Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin lymphoma gray, and they're having difficulty finding studies? I know the federal government has a um, research, clinicaltrials.gov, and if you go on that, you should be able to see what clinical trials are available, and I then would check with your local cancer centers to see what they have open. Um, that's where I would start. I'd like to add this one thing. This is Katie, and um, Be The Match has a relatively new program called the Jason Carter Clinical Trials Program, and essentially we've, we've taken trials from clinicaltrials.gov and put them into plain language on our website that is more accessible to people, easier to understand, and kind of basic, um, and it has all sorts of trials for, for the blood disorders and GVHD and lots of things. So it's a, it's a good resource to use. You can set up parameters for what kind of study you're looking for, what kind of trial, and then it will alert you if something new has been added that meets those parameters. And we also have staff here on site who can provide guidance and help get you to a clinical trial that's appropriate. So just another resource, Jason Carter Clinical Trials Program. Um, which is a program of Be The Match. Great. Thank you, ladies. Uh, another person writes, I have fits of anger that last for a few minutes and lash out at family members who do not deserve the treatment. Is this a symptom of PTSD or anxiety? This is Amanda. Um, I think, you know, it could be a sign of a lot of things. It could, it, I think, um, it depends on how often it's happening. If it's a once in a blue moon thing that happens, could just be normal response to um, stress. I think, however, if it's starting to become a habit, especially if that's not really your baseline of how you dealt with, with stress in the past, I think then maybe it, it might be a good idea to, to talk with someone and, and maybe have that evaluated. Katie, I don't know if you have any insights on that. The, the one thing I would like to add is that it's important to consider for whomever asked this question if you're taking prednisone or any corticosteroid because steroid-induced psychosis and depression and um, you know other mental health concerns related to steroids is actually pretty common and um, it's really important, it can, it can escalate, and it's really important to intervene quickly. So that would be my um, first thought. Of course, I agree with Amanda, you know, go in and talk to the doctor and be assessed, but also if you are on steroids, mention that as a possibility that that, that could be the cause. Yeah, I think that's great. Absolutely. Okay, is it normal to have blood transfusions after a bone marrow transplant? Yes, it is. Lots of them. Okay, perfect. <laughs> it, is there an upper age where bone marrow transplant would not be recommended? We really don't use age as our criteria anymore. Uh, 20 years ago we did, but now it's really performance status, other diseases that you may have, so if you have heart disease um, or other factors that would make it more risky for you to proceed. Um, if you're having an autologous versus an allogeneic stem cell transplant, those are looked at very differently because the risks after them are different. So I have seen patients definitely in their 70s, um, and so it really depends on how 
the individual looks. Perfect. What about if a patient has a limited appetite? Are vitamin and dietary supplements advised? I love to use my dietitian here at, um, in our clinic. He's wonderful. And he has a lot of really good resources on the kinds of um, supplements. We do encourage patients to, um, there's Ensures and Boosts and Premier Pro. Pro Premier Protein Shake, Carnation Instant Breakfast, all are wonderful, especially if somebody has low appetite, as to use as supplement, but not in replacement of actual food and drinks and things like that. Okay, great. Um, uh, I have another writer here that says, is the five-year survivor mark that important for an increase or decrease in possible relapse and other cancers? So the longer you live after transplant, the decreased chance of your original diagnosis occurring. So at each time point is important, and we celebrate every time point. And the secondary cancers or other cancers that can happen after transplant um, are really the longer you go, the, the increased risk we have of them. But that says for everybody. So the older we all get as a population, the more likely we are that cancer could happen. So it's really being due diligent and going to your colonoscopies and having your mammograms done because if we can catch it early, we can take care of it and then it doesn't become a major issue down the road. Great, thank you. Um, we have another person here who had a bone marrow transplant way back in 92 that gets uh, magnesium infusions weekly and deals with chronic diarrhea. She's wondering if this could be a possible late effect from chronic graft versus host disease? The diarrhea could be a late effect of GVHD for sure, um, but I do know that magnesium causes diarrhea. Even IV infusions can cause diarrhea, though not as often or as severe as oral infusions. Um, I don't know the specifics of your, your magnesium need, but um, there are other possibilities. You could try a different type of oral medication and see if that helps for the magnesium and to um, get rid of the diarrhea. But you could, um, if it continues to persist, the colonoscopy may be warranted. Okay, thank you. Um, we have one woman who said last winter, I kept a cold for the whole winter. She was one year and five months post-transplant, but her blood work was excellent. Now that she is two years post-transplant with great blood work, shouldn't her immunity be strong enough to keep the colds away or at least to get rid of them? That is hopeful, yes. But as we heard earlier from another patient, their immunoglobulins were low and needed that IVIG every month to sort of help with that. And that can happen after transplant, even though the immune system, it's like you're a little baby when you're first born and you've never seen anything. And then as you mature, that immune system hopefully will be stronger and stronger. But it may require um, some attention so it's still in cold and flu season, we still want you to get the flu shot, we still want you to wash your hands really well, avoid the people that are sick, and hopefully this year will be better than last year. Agreed. Um, what is the rate of surviving a transplant? I think that's another good CIBMTR, the Center for International Blood and Marrow Transplant Program, because they do have such good data, and they collect data from all over the country and compile it. So you could see, based on what kind of transplants and the original diagnosis and age of patients and what the outcome would be. Okay, let's see here. Thank you. Um, how common are dental issues with uh, post-transplant patients? So if you have dry mouth, the chance of getting um, a cavity is much higher, whether it's caused from graft-versus-host disease or medications. 
So we do have patients who um, have more dental issues after transplant depending on that. Also, we want to make sure that um, we're keeping track of the jaw health and the gum health. And we've had people who unfortunately because of gum disease have had to have their teeth removed. And sometimes if you have other diseases, like if you are diabetic, then we worry about oral care. And if you're on steroids for a long time, we worry about um, that issue of, of losing bone health also in the jaw and in the teeth. So we do recommend every six months dental exam. Okay, thank you. And then I'm going to pose this last one here. What role does cytogenetics play in long-term survival of a bone marrow transplant patient? It depends on the cytogenetics of the disease, and this may be one of those questions that you ask your transplant provider because it it does vary. And those get a little more complicated the more cytogenetic abnormalities we find. So it's a very, it's a moving target. It's a great question, but it's a very big moving target. Okay, perfect. Well, I know we've already gone a half hour past our original, but we definitely wanted to get to as many questions as we could. I just want to thank our speakers. You are a wealth of knowledge, and I know you are so appreciated being here today. I want to thank our LINK partners. We cannot do these programs without you, and so we so appreciate you. Uh, I also want to let everyone know that uh, we're going to be sending a quick survey out after this webinar that's just going to help us keep the quality of our programs the best they can be. Uh, so please keep an eye out for that. And if there is anything else we can do to support you, please reach out to us at the National Bone Marrow Transplant link. Thank you all, and have a great day. Thank you. That does conclude today's webinar. You may disconnect your line at this time and have a wonderful day. We thank you for your participation today.